Hi, welcome to the Zen of Reffing Roller Derby Lesson 1. I'm filming this on May 9th, 2018. The contents of this presentation is up to date as of this recording. Since this is the first lesson, I want to start with some background information, both on myself and this program. It's going to take a little bit, but future lessons will only have brief introductions. I'm Stephen Lormer, better known as the Axis of Stevel. I'm the author of the Zen of Reffing Roller Derby, a training manual for referees. I have just under six years experience as a referee. I'm affiliated with the Garden State Roller Girls, where I serve as head referee, and dual affiliated with the Jersey Derby Brigade. I'm a level one referee certified under WIFTA's old certification system. I'm the lead referee, I'm sorry, the lead writer at Roller Derby Rule of the Day. I clerk for the WIFTA Rules Committee. I've THR'd several tournaments, and I've presented multiple officiating clinics and training programs. In short, I'm not the world's foremost expert when it comes to refing roller derby, but I do know what I'm talking about, especially when it comes to basic and intermediate training for referees. My contact information will be in the notes just below this video on YouTube. The Zen of Refing Roller Derby, as I mentioned, is a training manual for referees. It's designed for new, novice, and intermediate referees. It's used at 30 leagues in the United States, Canada, France, Spain, Germany, Argentina, Japan, New Zealand, and who knows where else. It's also good as a refresher course uh, for referees that just, uh, they've been away for a little while and they want to get back into the swing of things. It's all ideal for referees that are lacking a good mentor, uh, or even if they have a mentor, uh, the program can be a good supplement to what they're learning uh, from them. The training program is currently 27 lessons with more being written regularly. Uh, the training program is not meant to be a substitute for studying the rules of flat track roller derby, the risk management guidelines, the officiating cues, codes, and signals, the officiating procedures for the rules of flat track roller derby, and a host of other documents. Think of my program as sort of a Cliff Notes version of refing. It's a great primer, but if it's all you ever study, you will never learn the material well enough to be a good referee. This course, uh, the training program that I designed, is best done by jointly reading through the online documents with a more experienced referee who can elaborate on the points that I'm making. The latest version of the program can always be found at www.tinyurl.com slash zenreffing. The online presentation, which you're seeing now, the purpose here is to train referees who lack a local mentor, as well as to speed up referee training by providing 24 hour a day access to useful officiating lessons. They will eventually become obsolete as they can't be updated as easily as the written document. When they become badly out of date, I will update them by putting on an entirely new video and I'll provide a link at the beginning of this video to show you where the, the newest version can be found. The purpose of the green screen behind me is to basically, so I can show you video clips uh, in later uh, lessons, showing you examples of both legal and illegal uh, actions. I've got a whole host of interesting footage that I've taken with my helmet cam. I'm not certain how excited skaters are going to be about uh, giving me permission to display their foibles on these videos. So it remains to be seen how much I'm going to be able to show you. So if you have access to good footage showing both penalties and legal actions, and if you have permission to share it, I'd love to have your permission to use some of these clips in future lessons. Now I want to give it a little disclaimer. The WFTDA, the MRDA, the JRDA, none of these are responsible for the content in the Zen of Refing Roller Derby Training Manual or this presentation, nor do they make any claims as to the accuracy of its content. And although I do clerk for the WIFTA Rules Committee, I'm definitely not speaking on behalf of them. Also, I'm not infallible. If I make a mistake, please point it out to me so I can correct it. Like Werner, bon uh, Werner von Bombed says on his great RevEd training videos, I'm just a guy who wants to help out. I also want to make a special disclaimer on gender and language. I predominantly ref adult women's derby, so in speaking, I sometimes will default by referring to skaters as she or her. This is not in, uh, it's, as opposed to saying just they or them. This is not intended to be disrespect any men who play roller derby, nor is this intended to disrespect any skaters who prefer they or them pronouns. I'm not doing these presentations off a prepared script, so at some point they're just they're going to slip into my speech. I want to give one final note. As you watch these lessons, pause and write down any questions you have. Write them down immediately, because if you don't, I promise you're going to forget them. Asking questions is very important for anyone's rule education in roller derby or frankly anything else in life. Feel free to ask me any questions you have in the comments of this video. 
but also ask the same questions of other officials as well. Getting multiple perspectives is a good thing. Just make sure the people that you're asking know what they're talking about. All right, on to lesson one, duties, skills, and ethics. Referees have a number of duties during scrimmages and games. Their top priority, we maintain safety. That is, as I say, top priority. We will grind the game to a halt if it's necessary to do so. We will, we will cause the game to end early if it's necessary to maintain safety. It's very rare that happens, you know, but we will do it. Safety is the absolute top priority of what we do. Next, we protect game flow. We want the game to continue on. We don't uh, want to like stopping for constant timeouts, uh, you know, all the time. Some clock stoppages are absolutely appropriate. Some are legal. Some of the teams have rights to request. But we really want to avoid unnecessary stoppages, um, both because of our own officiating, uh, both because of like neutral things like, uh, you know, track issues and things like that. We want to prevent those from occurring if we can, as well as we want to prevent uh, the teams from taking, um, you know, inter illegally interrupting the game flow, uh, you know, causing timeouts to be, uh, to be created to deal with problems that occur. We penalize illegally gained advantage. That's the big one you think about when you think of us giving penalties over there. Uh, although we will also penalt uh, penalize unsporting conduct and certain technical infractions as well, like that. And that goes in with establishing an atmosphere of professionalism, impartiality, and fairness over there. We also, uh, our duties outside of a game, we teach the rules to other people. This also, in this includes skaters, this includes other officials, this includes NSOs. This includes our poor spouses that aren't in Derby that really don't want to hear about it, that we teach anyway. We teach the rules over there. And let me tell you, the best way to learn the rules is by teaching it, which is another reason why I'm doing this presentation. We supervise or assist in track setup. This varies from league to league. At Jersey Derby Brigade, it's customary that the referees set the track up before every game. It's always the referee crew doing it with some uh, volunteer effort from skaters and NSOs, but mostly the referees there. At other leagues I've seen, the referees have nothing to do with it. It's absolutely the skaters doing it. This will be a cultural difference from league to league over there. However, ultimately, the head referee of a game is in charge of making sure that the track was set up correctly, unless it's like a tournament, in which case it would be the tournament head officials and the games, of, uh, games officials over there. Um, we officiate drills and scrimmages at practice uh, uh, practices. We basically help our leagues to learn over there and you know officiating as much as we can even if it's just simple little jammer to pivot line drills over there is helpful for both the skaters and our own development we also continue with our own professional development it's not enough to just show up to practice and just skate around over there uh, you have to study the rules you have to study other documents like the ones i listed before as well as things like the wifta forfeit policy the wifta sanctioning document the wifta expulsion policy there's a lot of documents in there with a lot of useful stuff that you can expel especially if you want to ever become a head referee and be running the show so to speak you really want to know this stuff like that but your professional development also includes working on your skating skills it's not enough to just kind of tootle around over there or to phone in your skating you really want to be good at this you don't necessarily have to train like an Olympic athlete unless you want to be say, a jammer referee at the absolute top levels of roller derby. But at the same time, you really can't show up just once every month or two and, you know, try to remember how to skate and then just kind of figure you'll be great in a game. It doesn't work that way. We mentor newer referees. There is an eternal shortage of referees in the sport. Mentoring new referees, help training them up, bring them into the fold over there. This is very important for the long-term survival of our community. We are not such a highly paid and, pre and prestigious profession that we have a line of people six miles long wanting to do this. Uh, that's not the way it works. So you need to identify people that you can bring into the fold and spend time working with them. This is especially important for working uh, with women and people of color in the refing community, which tends to have an awful lot of white men uh, in stripes like this. So, you know, do what you can to bring more people in there. Do what you can to support them and their learning. Above all, your duty here, have fun. We don't get paid a lot. We don't get paid at all usually. So if you're not enjoying yourself, you're gonna quit. You're gonna burn out, and there's a good chance your friends are not going to enjoy the sport without you, and they're gonna quit as well. So have fun. Find a good life balance with roller derby, and uh, enjoy yourself like that. That's really how you're getting paid, is from your sense of community and the fun you're having. So make it work. 
Now let's talk about the required skills for referee. There are three of them. Number one, skating skills. Got to be able to skate. That's that's just absolutely required. You don't have to be able to skate like awesome. You don't have to be able to skate great. It depends on the positions that you're going to learn over there. I know referees that are not great skaters over there, and some of them have become IPR specialists over there because IPR as a position that uh, it's inside pack referee, it does not tax their skating as much. I also know referees that are great skaters that love to be IPR like that. But on the other hand, if you're going to be an outside pack referee, you're going to need a, be able to go faster. You're going to be able to stop faster. You're going to have to be able to turn, fa you know, do transitions faster like that. It's going to push your skating skills, you know, uh, more. So the faster the game, the higher levels of derby you want to work, the better your skating skills are going to be able to need. You will never get done working on them. Just as though, just as even the number one, you know, team in the world is constantly working on their plow stops because they can get that fraction of a second even better like that. It's the same thing with your skating skills. It's very easy to just start, you know, I'm good enough and just kind of phone it in and not push them. I encourage you to be wary about doing that because uh, your skills are just not naturally going to stay at their peak. You know, you're going to have to keep working on them over time if you want to keep your skills up. Number two, rules mastery. Got to know the rules. You can't ref if you don't know what you're trying to, you know, what you're trying to enforce out there on the track. The rules are traditionally updated every two years uh, in odd numbered years, although even number years sometimes will have a, an update, you know, uh, you know, they'll fix some writing or, or add some new scenarios for the casebook, things like that. Uh, new scenarios will also come out during the year as well. You got to know this stuff. You don't necessarily have to know this in and out and be a walking rules encyclopedia, although it certainly helps, um, but you need to have at least a working mastery of the rules. If you want to be a head referee, your mastery is going to have to be higher. If you want to be a referee at the higher levels of derby or work in competitive environments such as tournaments or very high level sanctioned games, you're going to have to uh, have that a higher level of rules mastery as well. To do that, I suggest reading the rules, then reread them. Read them again. Read them a third time. I try to read the rules at least every six months. When I do so, I try to have a piece of paper, you know, like, like I, I print them out, I crack them open, and I write questions I have on the back of the page prior to it because you will have questions. And as I said before, if you do not write them down, you will forget them. You'll probably remember them during a game too because now you're in a situation, you're like, oh crap, was that a penalty or not? Oh God, I meant to find out. And now you're impacting a game because you didn't learn the rules right. So, so write your questions down, get your answers, study the rules and learn the stuff. Third, you need the ability to correctly spot, process, and call out penalties. This can take years to develop. It is the hardest skill of the three over there. You are quite literally developing new mental pathways over there, like in, in your brain over there. You're having to, uh, you know, pack formation. You have to judge multiple 10-foot links over there, followed by a 20-foot link, and judge who's in it and who's not, where every object is in motion, sometimes in completely different directions over there. This is not something in life where we are just regularly doing this activity so much that we just naturally become great at it like that. You have to develop uh, these skills over there. you got to be able to practice how the, you know, how, to, how the game works, how the officiating is working over there. And the and best way to learn this by going to scrimmages. There's absolutely no substitute for this. I realize not all leagues scrimmage in the state of New Jersey. We only have one league that has weekly scrimmages, and that's very difficult for people on the other side of the state. Doesn't matter. Find a way to get to them over there. there there's going to be leagues somewhere. Find a way to get to their scrimmages if you can. You know, if not, just sit there and become the world's foremost expert at watching game footage online over there. Just you have to be able to see them. If you can't, you know, if you don't practice at seeing them, you're not going to call out the, you're not going to be able to call the penalties when they occur. Also, a lot of referees have the bad habit. They swallow their whistle. You know, they, they lift the whistle, finger whistle up and they don't call it. And they lift it up and they don't call it. They think they see it, not sure, really don't want to accidentally screw up the game. So they don't call it over there. This goes hand in hand in that. Uh, some of that is what I what I like to refer as uh, like um, referee boot camp. Like I've heard in the the army that they'll teach uh, sergeants and they'll have them go yell at toilets over there. You know to you know giving orders. 
I have taken my referees and I have made them not a toilets. I wouldn't do that to them unless they really weren't calling any penalties. I will have them make them go and yell penalties at pylons until they just get in the muscle motion of making that over there. So the ability, you know, to spot, process, and call out penalties is really on any number of levels. It's anywhere from just seeing them and experience and developing the neural pathways to just getting that muscle memory to just overcoming the that hesitation that you have of I really don't want to screw up the game. What if I'm wrong? You know, don't do, you know the, the the kid in the outfield in baseball. You know, oh, I hope the ball doesn't come over here. You know, you don't want to be that ref. Work on this. Next, let's talk about conduct. Referees want to display good judgment in regards to behavior, honesty, fairness, and integrity. Referees can very easily develop a bad reputation, and you really don't want to do that. You want to treat league and community members with respect, with dignity, and fairness. Now, all of this, you know, fairness, behavior, on, you know, watch your behavior, integrity, this is all during a game and outside of the game as well, which leads into my next point be wary about what you post on social media about roller derby. It's fine to talk about it. Roller derby is very, very uh, social media oriented. We're all on there. We all like to talk. That's totally fine. But it is a very small place. Your posts, the internet is a very small place. Your posts can very easily come back to haunt you. So be careful what you're writing on the internet, particularly when you're drunk, when you're mad, when you're tired. If it doesn't need to be said immediately, sleep on it. You can always post it the next day. You want, to you want to maintain exemplary or even over-the-top standards of neutrality and impartiality. What that means is, like, there's no clapping during a game. You don't want to display team logos, you know, on your clothing when you show up. You don't necessarily want to pose for pictures with skaters, etc. Um, you know, avoid giving hugs to skaters over there. No, like, high fives, you know, during a game or celebra celebratory behavior. Now... Use your judgment in all of this over there. I, I knew a referee that would not shake hands with skaters in public after a game, even if the, they were just coming in the middle, just, you know, thank you, referee, you know, and they wanted to shake your hand. Nope, wouldn't do it. I think that's over the top, and that was a little unnecessary. And I know referees that are, you know, very happy to give a hug to their friends when they show up. But there's a lot of difference between, you know, going around hugging, uh, you know, lots of people at uh, a very competitive tournament game and just you know, your local league, interleague, where everybody knows each other and it's all very relaxed. So, you know, use some judgment with this. It's also fine to applaud a skater whose retirement after 10 years in Derby was just announced or, you know, applauding after like two skaters uh, get engaged or after somebody does a really inspiring rendition of the national anthem or whatever like that. What you really don't want to do is just applaud anything that could per be perceived as favoring a skater or a team. Um, Along with the plus, that also includes, like, skaters like to do their victory lap after a game. New officials, myself included, back in the day, fall in the trap, but they go out there and they want to, like, high-five the team when they go around. They, they don't understand that that's really not a good idea. Uh, I had a referee take me by the ear, like, nope, you know, and drag me out of there. If you do it, somebody's going to do it to you. And you're go you will, if you stay in the sport long enough, watch new officials make that mistake as well, and you will grab them by the ear and drag them out of there as well. Referees need to uh, demonstrate a consistently high commitment to safety. We lose our authority to enforce safety in others if our own behavior is lax or inconsistent. This is a lot better than it was in years past. In years past, safety gear, frankly, wasn't really used by referees, you know, like 10 years ago. And even five years ago, it was not used by some leagues nearly as much as it should be. Now is much, much, much better on it. But even so, you know, like, don't go skating around, you know, before a game like that while you're warming up with your helmet straps undone or your wrist guards off or something like that. It's just, you know, if you demonstrate that you are committed to safety, now you have the moral authority to enforce that in others. Referees discuss their rules and procedural disagreements privately, not in front of others. The more formal or public the event, the more discretion that should be exercised. Don't raise your voice when you're arguing with other officials when other people can hear. Don't be like yelling things across the track, you know, uh, things like that. We're professional. You don't want someone dressing you down in front of the skaters. You don't want to be dressing somebody else down like that. And you also really don't want to show to the skaters that um, we uh, we don't know what we're talking about. We're, we're having an argument and we're now mad and we're angry at each other like that, you, you know. Uh, 
people like to talk about police as of what they call the blue wall of silence because they all kind of stand together. People see referees sometimes as just supporting each other. We're sort of a black and white striped wall of silence like that. We really do disagree with each other. We disagree with each other all the time, all the time. And that's fine. But we are very professional with how we uh, demonstrate that disagreement when others are watching. So carry that into your own behavior. As a referee, you need to avoid conflicts of interest. You have to disclose all that exists to a head referee uh, before each game. For, uh, or, for example, um, familia. My wife is skating in the game, you know, like that. My sister is in the game. My daughter is in the game, you know, whatever, uh, like that. Uh, financial, like that. My boss is in the game, like that. You know, uh, my boss is coaching for that team. You know, associational. My roommate is in the game, like that. It's it's just... It, we in Derby understand that we have this sort of like those very, very mild conflicts of interest all the time. It's fine. Disclose it like that. It's really not going to be an issue, except maybe at like playoff or very high level Derby games. They might start avoiding some of those conflicts. What you really need to avoid are conflicts involving things like gambling on a game over there. We don't take bets, you know. Referees, we crack jokes on occasion about like, OK, you know, what, what's the bribe? You know, how much is the bribe pool up to for today or, or whatever, you know? whatever like you know tithes to the referee guild or something like that you know a little joke is fine if you're doing it in the correct company but don't go post that. don't post that on social media because boy is that going to get misunderstood but we don't gamble on the game we do not we do not want financial conflicts of interest over there with how it's going to go remember that goes back to your impartiality and your fairness if you could be perceived even if you really are doing your best to officiate the game but now you're perceived as not doing that we avoid public predictions about the game. We all know some games are going to be massacres and, or one team has got a major advantage over the other. We get that. And privately with another official, maybe you can discuss that. But you definitely, definitely do not want to discuss this publicly, especially on social media before a game. Oh, that would be like the worst thing you could do. Don't do it. We avoid discussing publicly our opinions of skaters, coaches, other officials, etc. There will be people in the sport you don't like. There'll be people in the sport you don't respect. It's going to happen like that. Do not publicly post them like that on social media or even just be announcing that. Word gets around. Word gets around very, very easily in this this sport. That The more you dislike someone, the more you should be professional and neutral and always respectful regarding that person. You want to refrain from gratuitous displays of attention-seeking behavior while on duty. That means no dancing, you know, like that before the jam begins. And boy, that, you know, like that. And, and let me tell you, when Lady Gaga gets playing, my gay jeans get going. I want to dance like that. Really, I do. But no, mm -mm, nope, nope, nope. Got to keep that very neutral like that. So, uh, you know, we the, the attention is on the skaters. They're the ones putting down, you know, the dues money. Usually, although some referees pay dues. But they're the ones really that are putting in all the time. The effort, the dues money. The focus is on them. We have our rewards. Being the center of attention is not one of them. Like that. Keep the spotlight on them, not on us. Referees need to have zero tolerance of alcohol or drugs at derby related events while you're officiating and or on skates. You know, al alcohol often consumed at the after parties, fine. That's that's one thing if you're legal of legal age to do that. Absolutely not when you're on skates. Never, 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 never. We don't go drinking before we're on skates. I have watched, or I've heard of officiating crews at leagues that have blown up because somebody was having drinks, you know, at brunch on the morning of the game when the game wasn't even till like six, seven o'clock in the evening, like that. Do not mix alcohol or drugs on the day of an event. Bad, 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 bad idea, like that. Both from a safety perspective, uh, from a being able to do your job officiating wise perspective. You know, and from just a huge derby drama that we really don't want to have perspective. Don't do it. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, in a sense, in all of this, never, ever, ever, ever be dismissive of the non-skating officials. They are of officials of equal ranks and equal importance to the referees. However, a lot of referees have gotten it in their mind that the NSOs, you know, those are like referees that can't skate, so they just do like the little paperwork and such. And I realize it's sometimes a little easy to look down on them when you see NSOs that are being like drafted from league skaters and they don't really want to be NSOing, they want to be skating. NSOs would much rather have 
a crew of diehard dedicated NSOs, just like we wouldn't want to be drafting people to ref that don't really want to be refing, but they'll do it just as a favor to us. Good NSOs, like good referees, work hard to develop their skills. They spent years developing these skills over there. Show them the respect to which they are duty. Not just the good NSOs, but anybody who's wearing that pink or black shirt during a game. Show them respect. They have earned it. Also, learning at least the basics of being an NSO will make you a better referee. So spend some time doing their job. While you're you know, going through this program and you're not yet ready to maybe ref a game, that's the perfect time to be going in there and learning the basics of being an NSO. And I promise you, if you talk to your league head, league's head NSO, they will be eager to train you to do that job or to do any number of NSO uh, jobs over there. They're always looking for people that have an interest in doing that. And as I say, it will make you a better referee. That concludes this lesson. We'll be back next time to discuss whistles. Thank you.